Today is June the 24th, 2014. My name is Tanya Fincham, along with Alex Bishop, and we're with Oklahoma State University. And today we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to speak with Henry Miller. And this is part of our Oklahoma 100 Year Life Project, so thank you for having us today. Well, I'm glad to have you. Let's start with having you tell us when and where you were born. Well, I was born in Charleston, West Virginia, April the 22nd, 1914. And I only lived there two weeks. My mother and father were on a business trip and I happened to come along too soon. So uh, we came back home to Suffolk, Virginia, my hometown where I was raised. And uh, uh, I lived in Suffolk off and on until I went in the Navy in 1931. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, my father uh, built homes. He, he managed lumber yards. He was in the lumber business and the construction uh, business most of his life. But he moved to different parts of the country and took different levels of jobs. But uh, the one he enjoyed the most was in Sturgis, Michigan, a little town on the southern border of Michigan. Or he was operating a, a lumber yard, a manager for a lumber yard, and he was getting all of his lumber free. So he was building small homes, just as in the early 20s, for returning veterans from World War I. And he had some designs that uh, incorporated a lot of uh, space savers that was new at that time. He got a lot of uh, satisfaction of building those homes. And did your mother work? Yes, my mother and father separated, and my mother worked as a stenographer and office manager uh, up until she retired when she was 65. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had one brother and one sister, but they were older than I, five or six years. And, uh, my sister was the oldest, my brother was next. And uh, they uh, went to live with my dad for a good part of the time. They did come back and forth from Virginia to Michigan, where my dad was. So we, uh, I never got to uh, participate in a lot of activity with my brother and sister. I was always a baby to family. I think they're a little jealous of the attention I got because there was so much age difference. So, uh, but yes, uh, I, um, my brother and sister finally came back to Suffolk and settled there after they had uh, gotten their education in Michigan and came back uh, to get married and, and go on with their lives. And where did you go to school, elementary school and, and forward? Well, where did I go to school? Mm -hmm. Well, it started in uh, because I didn't have room in our school system in Suffolk, a small town. I had to, uh, in the first grade, I started in the Masonic Temple. They just had a back room big enough for about 20 or 30 uh, young children. So I started there in the first grade. In the second grade, I moved to uh, uh, the school grounds at the end of Clay Street for, at the Thomas Jefferson High School, actually, but they had some uh, out of buildings that they used for the lower grades, second through fourth. Second through third, we were in concert hut, or what would constitute a small building for us uh, to attend. In fourth grade, we moved into the building at Thomas Jefferson High School at that time, as before they built the existing high school. So it was. Uh, it was three jumps, starting out in Masonic Temple, with no connection to the Masons, but just a place where they could accommodate the new children that had come along in Suffolk, that they didn't have room for over in the other schools. And then for high school, actually? Uh, high school, Suffolk High School until the 10th grade, and uh, I went in the Navy. Uh, I, I never finished high school, I went in the Navy. And while I was in the Navy, I saved, my, uh, I saved a good amount of my salary. And I attended Spartan School here in Tulsa. I came to Spartan School and 
in August of 1938 and took flight course and aviation uh, mechanics course for both aircraft and engines. But um, I'm in the middle of a long story, but I, I don't know how. I, do you want me to tell you more about my education? Uh, at Spartan, there's a story in itself right there, the different, uh, different interests I had uh, while I was at Spartan during the, uh, between 38 and 40. How did you learn about, well, let's back up. At, so in 10th grade, you dropped out of high school, or you finished the 10th grade? I'm sorry, I... You, did you finish the 10th grade? F the 5th grade, no, I didn't finish the 5th, I just... The 10th. I, I was uh, I promoted from the Lord 10th grade to the high 10th. I may have misstated that. 10th grade was, middle 10th grade was uh, my highest uh, level. And, and then you joined the Navy? Yes. Were you, how old were you? I was 17. Your mother had to sign yes, for I you? Yes, I was, yeah. Yeah, but you see, we, that was a depression. My mother was having a hard time supporting a family on her salary, and she had some health problems herself. So uh, to uh, ease the load on uh, in my family, why well, I thought uh, I thought I'd be able to, to go to school in Penn School and learn to fly. That's what the recruiting officer was telling me. Uh, I, I, I no sooner had uh, gotten in, into the Navy that Roosevelt started economizing. He cut everybody's pay. A lot of people don't know this. Roosevelt cut all federal employees, including military, 10%. And he shut down Pensacola for enlisted men only. The Annapolis graduates uh, were still able to, to get flight training, so I was real disappointed, and it, it uh, set up a uh, attitude that I uh, kept me in trouble. Uh, yeah. I spent too much time in bars and places like that and instead of uh, applying myself as I should. As a radio operator, was the second choice for my for my time in the Navy. And how long were you in the Navy? From December the 1st, 1931 until July the 28th, 1938. So, seven, eight, seven years? Yes. Two, two rotations? Uh, yes, I had two, two uh, discharges. Mm -hmm. I got one discharge after the expiration of what they call a minority cruise. When you're under age, they, they had a term to apply. And you, uh, you enlisted until the day before you were 21. Minority crews is where the term applied. And then you had to re-enlist, re which I did. And I had the second discharge uh, in, uh, in July of 38. Uh, During that time, did you have to go overseas and do well, anything? Well, I may, Yes. My first assignment was Special Service Squadron. Nobody ever heard of that. We had a, uh, we had a light cruiser. <clears throat> I was on a light cruiser in Memphis with a contingent of Marines. And we cruised back and forth in the Central American area. And we were there to protect our, our, our agencies. Our, our, anyhow, it uh, we had 50 Marines that were ready to go ashore any time there was trouble. It's just like uh, what happened in Benghazi here. It wouldn't have happened uh, during Roosevelt's time. He had a, a force of men ready to go, to go to hot spots, uh, that's not a good word, go to places where there's political unrest and, and uh, calm things down. And of course it was for the benefit, it depended on how many American businesses were in, got involved in these revolutions. And in Nicaragua, it was a, it's a long story right there why the Sandinistas were rebelling. But I got down there at the, uh, all, uh, the very end of the revolution when they had it, uh, had it settled. But we were uh, stationed in Corinto, Nicaragua on the Pacific coast. And as we withdrew the Marines, from uh, 
at the interior. We were there with our 50 Marines to take over and keep things calm and corrupt so that they could uh, disembark without any riots or uh, trouble. I had a lot of Nicaraguans that came down as, they, as the Marines were disembarked. That's not a good word. As the Marines were embarked in the Henderson, the USS Henderson, a lot of uh, a lot of Nicaraguan girls had uh, had families with them. The Marines had been down there from 1928 until 1932. And there was a lot of jungle fighting. You didn't hear anything about it. I never heard anything about it. Mm. But um, there was a... Um, I was in Corinto off and on several times before, I was, uh, before we were relieved of our duty. And I came up to the States uh, uh, aboard the Memphis, transferred to the Richmond, and then the Marblehead. I was on the three light cruises over that period of time. Yeah. And I got to go to China. They started, the Japs were uh, closing in on, on Shanghai. They, had, uh, uh, they were fighting in the streets of Shanghai and on both sides of the river when we came in. But uh, we were taking 1,300 Marines to the American Embassy uh, in an area they called an international settlement. Uh, embassies of a lot of different countries uh, were uh, protected within this area. I guess England, France, Germany, or whoever, Italian, the Italian embassies. So we got there in time to keep the Japs from occupying the international settlement. Mm. Uh, but they were fighting in the city and on both sides of the road when we got there. In fact, we never had to fight the Japs to get in there. The Japs sent a um, heavy cruiser and two destroyers to, to uh, keep us from coming up the Yangtze River. We were about to met these guys about Oh, about 30 miles from the entrance to the, to the Yangtze. The Japanese cruiser got uh, across our, our path. It's not a good word. Our, our, anyhow, we were heading straight up the road, but we were blocked by the cruiser and two destroyers. So they had some kind of flag signal to exchange. Uh, there's a way to talk, international flag signals that were, we advised them we were not stopping. They wanted us to stop, but we weren't stopping. So they didn't want to risk a collision. They had already sunk an American ship, uh, the USS Penai. So we were on a, they thought that uh, we were on the verge of, or oh, if they created an incident and not allowed us passage through there, that it might be considered an act of war. I don't know what to read into that, except they did let us come through. Mm. But the cruiser went off uh, out of sight. The two destroyers circled around and came up alongside the, the Marblehead and alongside the, the Shawmont with Henderson. Shawmont with all the Marines. So we went up, up the river. The destroyers were trying to alert the people on both sides of the river that were fighting. That we we were being protected by the Japs, by the, by their presence in the in the destroyer. So we got up, unloaded the Marines, and uh, pulled out after a short period of time, and went up into North China to uh, evacuate some more oil, oil company employees that were uh, being affected by fighting up in Shantung Province. So we. Um, we took, I forget, several hundred uh, old families aboard the, the Marblehead and they made a speed run down to Hong Kong. There was a dollar line, a passenger line down there waiting. Mm -hmm. So we um, I, I got that uh, accomplished and then we came back to St. Tower for our base. And we operated out of St. Tower after that. Did you feel in danger yourself at any point? I'm sorry. Did you feel like you were endangered at any point? Oh, not really. Now, the Japs would practice bombing runs on us once in a while. I guess that's what they were doing. 
planes would fly over and I'd see the bomb bay doors open. Uh, we'd go to general quarters just in case they get in and the aircraft guns are limited up. But no, we never had any confrontations other than the, uh, the heavy cruiser was trying to keep us from, from unloading those Marines. And what was your job? I was a radio operator. That and uh, up. We, uh, we had a lot of problems with the Japs trying to block our communications. And, uh, in fact, they had blocked the embassy communications up in St. Tao in North China. So we handled all of the uh, embassy traffic for them for quite a while, certainly about a month, I guess, and more. Did you consider making it a permanent career? Not at that time, not at that time. Uh, well, that's a long, that's a story in itself. <laughs> why? <laughs> but then, no, at that time, why? I was glad to be out there. I, I volunteered for the Asiatic Fleet when I, when I was assigned to, to Panama to the Special Service Squadron in, in Balboa. So I was uh, glad to get up to China and feel like I had a small part in uh, relieving the situation there. No one knew what would happen if the Japs did invade the international settlements, a large area. With uh, each nation has their own troops, it would have been uh, wildfire. Uh, it would have been a big fight because the Japs had tried to gain entrance to the international settlement. They come down to the gate, and they would demand entrance, and the Marine censors wouldn't let them in. So there was a lot of animosity in the Japanese uh, officers, because they were they were losing face with their. Uh, the troops that were with them when they were turn, turned away from uh, uh, coming into the compound. What they were kept coming in for, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of uh, bombing going on day and night, aircraft bombing in the city. So we heard a lot of it and saw some of it, but uh, we didn't get involved. So. So a couple of years later was Pearl Harbor. Do you remember where you were when that yes, all came down? Yes, I was working for Spartan. We were, had a flight uh, a training program for the Air Force, and I was working in the engine overhaul department as an assistant to the manager. And we had uh, we were overhauling aircraft engines for the Air Force. It was a, 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 a range of engines that they used in the in the uh, PT-19 airplanes that they were using in the flight program. So I was uh, contributing in, in some degree, but I wanted to, uh, would like to have gotten back in. But I have an honorable discharge, but the Navy wouldn't allow me to re-enlist because of uh, another long story with some of my uh, problems I have with alcohol. Nothing illegal, immoral. It was just that uh, I was uh, I was sent to Naval Hospital in Washington D.C. Uh, just a small hospital and no uh, retention, nothing like that, to dry out. They had their own system of uh, when uh, an enlisted man or an officer had a had a problem. Either it was a man who was on drugs. It was a mixture. Believe it or not, officers and the enlisted men in one hospital with no difference. Mm -hmm. So they uh, eased me out with an honorable discharge and said, well, uh, when I tried to re-enlist, it, uh, it didn't look like I'd be a very satisfactory enlisted, enlisted man. And they were right, uh, based on the trouble I was in uh, with the car wrecks. And I was an alcoholic. And, uh, Alcoholics don't get along very well, and well, it's in the military and the personal business. Well, did your time in the hospital work? Did you yeah, get? You bet. Did it? it sure did. It, uh, I stayed, I stayed out of bars, and I stayed away from alcohol. Saved my money. I was able to come, able to pay my 
tuition to Spartan School and realized what I wanted to get out of the Navy to start with was able to learn to fly and be around aircraft. And, and it, uh, it was a wonderful uh, satisfaction to be able to follow that. How did you learn about Sparta? Well, well while I was in the hospital there were some one of the men had uh, gotten some literature from four or five different schools, and Spartan had the best uh, offering. They offered me a job. So I was able to pay my tuition in advance, full of tuition, and work as a night watchman. Yeah, but that was uh, the best deal of all the other schools. Yeah. And how long was that program? How long was Spartan's program? Mm -hmm. The uh, aircraft and engine program would have been a full year. Flight program, I bought uh, flying time on the Tailcraft small cabin airplane. And then when I wasn't able, when my health broke down, I needed a doctor operation in Spartan. I asked uh, the school director if he could uh, refund any of my tuition. And he said, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the situation is the economic situation is so bad. He said, well, I'll give you flight time in the C-3. Well, I've been, I've been uh, working on the C-3s and watching the guys fly those things. And so I traded in the unused part of my tuition for flying time in the C-3 biplanes. Mm -hmm. So I got to, uh, I got a lot of satisfaction although I wasn't able to completely finish the course. And they gave me a job uh, as a, an assistant to the manager uh, of the engine, aircraft and engine department. I had my own office. We shared secretary and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and then take us on from there. What, where did well, you go? from Spartan, uh, I went to, uh, I got a job at Douglas Aircraft. Worked with him for eight years. Still in Oklahoma? Yes. Yeah at the local plant here at the airport. And then went out to Lockheed Missiles and Space Company. Now that is a jump. But well, that was a wonderful little town, Sunnyvale, California. The jobs they gave me were, uh, were uh, better than I had uh, and paid more than, than I was realizing from Douglas. And I was promised uh, an administrative level job if I would say, but this was in 64, and uh, we lost, Lucky lost a lot of contracts. The Gina Rocket, that was the main source of income, it had more than one failure. And uh, this, uh, the, the contracts were modified, so they had to lay us off. And at the time I was laid off, I contacted a friend back in Tulsa. He said, seriously, North Americans are, come on back to Tulsa and I can, I can get you in the back door. Or whatever he said, he said, come back to Tulsa and the, job, the jobs are here if you want to work as a planner. Which I did, and I stayed with uh, North American for 11 years and retired from North America. Yep. That's just about it. That would have been in the seven, no, 80s? Well, I retired in 1975. In the 80s, Ruth and I decided we wanted to retire to California. So we moved to a little town, Sonoma, California, in Northern, Northern California with mostly old folks and a kind of sleepy little place. And, but I was not happy there. No one knew what an airplane was, I don't think. <laughs> no, there were no Navy veterans. Uh, I know I made a contact with a soul in 23 years. I'm not exaggerating uh, with any people who had any, any idea of what it was like back here in Tulsa. Uh, well, at, um, Californians are a breed apart. They're, they're different people. I am uh, I'd like to have uh, worked out there for, for Lockheed. I would have liked to. I still would have been out there if, if I had. Uh, Lucky he had lost the contract. So what, when did you move back 
to Oklahoma. Yeah, 1980. Uh, see, uh, I came back this final time, 2007, when my wife was severely, when she was very ill. And uh, we moved into a, a retirement center, Forest Hills, in Broken Arrow. And Ruth died very soon after we after we moved in. I stayed there three years and uh, came up here to Town Village in July of uh, 2011. So I've been here about pretty soon. It'll be three solid years. So you've lived in various states. Where do you consider home? Well, I've lived in California off and on 37 years. Uh, and then eight, six years there in San Diego or more. And then uh, Sunnyvale, four years in Sunnyvale, Northern California, when I was working for Lockheed, and 23 years in Sonoma. So, and I've been in and out of California so many times that uh, uh, Talks has always been my home, uh, but uh, I would like to have spent more time in California. Well, let's back up a little bit and have you tell me how you met your wife. Well, it's, uh, she was a waitress in the Spartan cafeteria, and we began to see more of each other than uh, <laughs> in the cafeteria. We, we dated, and but she didn't like Tulsa and wanted to go back home to Missouri. I came from a little town, Aurora, Missouri. And I had to persuade her to stay in Tulsa uh, by agreeing to get married. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was, uh, it, it complicated my, uh, my uh, desire to fly more. I was going to pick up some more flying time and get a commercial license just for, as a sideline. But uh, once we were married, uh, my son was born about nine months and two days later. My, my daughter came along pretty soon after that. So I needed a, um, I, I couldn't do a lot of things that I wanted to do. Uh, it might have been good for me anyhow, who knows. When, when were you married? Uh, when were you married? Well, oh, hmm? uh, May the 17th, <laughs> 1939. 1939. May 17th, 1939. Yeah. So she was more than happy to move to California? Oh, yes. Yeah, she was, anything I wanted to do, she would, she'd go along with it. I'd try to satisfy her. And, make her happy where we went. And she wasn't hard to please, and it was a good thing because I know I made a lot of money. So flying is really your first love or your second love? Ah, uh, second. I used to like to drive race cars. Okay. I, I didn't, uh, when I was in the Navy, when I had this accident, I broke how to fracture back. I was practicing, practicing up racing on a athletic field that had a lot of loose gravel on it. Uh, uh, some boys on motorcycles and some cars would gather at night when the lights were out. And we'd go out there and we'd set up oil drums at either end of, of, of I guess they were about a quarter of a mile apart. We'd get out there <laughs> and race back and forth. So I was going sideways and making a turn there one night and the tire blew and I rolled my car and uh, pressed my vertebrae and uh, had blood in my spinal fluid. I really took a, 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 but that was something I wanted to do. Even when I was a little kid this day, I'd build my own airplanes and my own little race cars. I, I always had tools and, and equipment and uh, materials I could, uh, I'd take an old wagon and I'd put a, build a body on it like a race car or something. So I had the two interests in the, I'm still interested in both to this day, but I'm too old for it to have much to do with either activity. 
Well, did you do the race car business after you were married or before? Well, uh, uh, the, the professional, in the Navy, we were just a bunch of amateurs out there. We'd see who could uh, run, who, who could drink the most beer and who could uh, run the fastest. But uh, now I, um, I lost my train of thought. I was back in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what did you ask me on? I'm sorry. <laughs> I may have lost mine too. Well, no, no. I, I, I had uh, multiple but, interests, but those two primary things. I wanted to be paid, to uh, get a, a job where I'd get some money. And I built a race car out of three wrecked race cars and raced some here in Tulsa on a racetrack and made money. And this was in 1946. I have pictures of it over there in those posters. Uh, so after you got married? Yes, okay. yes. This was 1946 was when I first started uh, uh, racing professionally. After I tore the car up real bad, it frightened, frightened Ruth. Uh, I'd just go out and run, not regularly, but someone would drag in an old race car with no driver, no one wanted to get in it. Well, I'd take it out and run it around the track if they were trying to sell it or something like that. So I always kept my helmet and goggles with me, but I didn't use it very often. The, um, uh, but let's see. Oh, in 1955, I was out at the track one night and there's a couple in the box seats there and I was standing, leaning on the rail behind them and watching the races and we got to talking and uh, the lady asked me, um, uh, if I told her, I guess, I volunteered that I'd driven a race car. She said, well, what's out here and trying to the stock car? I said, I'm too old. I was 40 something at the time. So anyhow, uh, she said, you're not too old. Husband was taking it all in, but she was giving me advice. <laughs> she wanted to see me, so I, I uh, went down in the pits and I contacted the board and had an old junk and no one else wanted to drive. So I started driving uh, stock cars, and I do have pictures of them over there on that poster. Mm. But it was just a, um, it was a, it was a, a sport with me. I didn't. I didn't, wasn't about to quit my jobs and try to make a living doing that. I, I, I just was uh, too concerned with supporting my family. Was it the thrill of going fast or or what, what well, drew you to that? Yeah, if you ever lost control of a car on ice and it begins to slide sideways, that's what you get out on the racetrack, on these little racetracks with, with, uh, on the dirt tracks. You got to turn those things sideways to get around the corner, and that's the fun of it. Boy, they can just spin and get away from you so quick. And you're in a big bunch of other cars, and the guys are having trouble get, getting through the turns, and you're butting and shoving, and it's, it's, it, uh, it's, it gets pretty physical. Well, I never did care for getting out on the big tracks and running straight, straight, at, and turning left like. The guys on, on the big tracks today, most of the action is just following one guy, following another guy, and then turning left at the turn. <laughs> yeah. so, but the uh, the slick tracks is what I like. I like to feel the cars slide and slip, and because uh, that's what I thought it, it took the most skill, and to do it with no piece of junk, I, that gave me a lot of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of people. Um, who knew what I was trying to do and really uh, gave me credit. And uh, in fact, the, the top driver there wrote me a letter one time, <laughs> which I won't go into. But I had real good relationship to the professional drivers who had made their living driving race cars. So uh, I got a lot of uh, enjoyment. But it was strictly avocation, is that a good word? Or something to do for fun with never having any idea that I uh, would uh, try to make a living at it. Did you own race cars? Yes, okay. I bought one to start out. 
what I built, the, the one I was talking about in 1946, the three from the three junkers. So, but the first one was in a barn up in Kansas and then in a barn all during the war. So this is 1945, the fall of 1945. A friend of mine with an airplane, then I flew up there and found this, got this old thing out, from, get the hay off of it and took it out and passed it and drove it. So I, I bought it, right? <laughs> I bought it and uh, went up the next day and, and hauled it back home. And, but this is at the end of the racing season in 1945. I only had about three or four race meets. So I had a, a cracked block. I didn't know that the motor was in bad shape. So I sold it. And that's when I began to look for some cars to put together, some old wrecks that I could uh, put together myself. And I bought a, uh, a Southern Roebuck Army Jeep motor. They were selling military um, surplus back in those days, several different types, uh, Dodge motors and Willis Willis motors and several other kinds I'm not familiar with. So uh, the biggest expense I had was $102 on that motor. The total car, I only had 200 and some dollars in it. And after three nights, I had uh, had it paid for. And I've got the receipts right in it. No one believes that's it. I've got the receipts right here in a book. I've kept the pay receipts and I've kept the records of the, of the material I bought and where I bought it. Yeah. <laughs> so when it came time to teach your children how to drive, did you do it? Uh, yes. Yes, it was a different uh, time and a different uh, mode of instruction and whatever <laughs> word. <laughs> we, uh, we got on road. I taught Ruth to drive first and Ruth's help with the children. So we, we didn't have any problems, any uh, close calls or anything to be leery of. So we and the children got through it all right. And, and so far as I, or I know, uh, they were very careful and, and didn't have accidents and a bad driving record uh, afterward. Well, what got you interested in airplanes? Well, I got to go clear back to South Virginia. And uh, during the war, I was about five years old, four or five. There was planes that were in, uh, they were using in the Naval Air Station in Norfolk. Would sometimes fly over the city. And every once in a while, one of them would show off, he'd get up and he'd loop the thing, or uh, roll it or whatever. So they'd come over our little town only 20 miles away to, to have some fun. They couldn't do that, I guess, with their superior officers watching them. So they'd come over home, uh, over Suffolk, and perform a lot of aerobatics. Then they had some uh, blimps. They had two or three blimp power blimps that had uh, come over, and they'd come in real low. And they'd lean, lean over, the guys would lean over the side and holler at us kids and uh, wave. And uh, that was uh, so we had contact with uh, uh, with the military aviation when I was a real small kid. After the war, there was a lot of surplus. Jennies that were being bought and were hangered at a little field at Willroy, Willroy Virginia, about uh, five miles from, from Suffolk. And my uncle used to take me out on a Sunday drive. We go up and we watch these guys hold passengers, the barnstormers, I guess they'd call them. But they'd fly these old biplane Jennies. Uh, the Jenny name coming from the initial JN4 or something like that that the Air Force had on them. But they were uh, slow flying old airplanes, good for instruction. So I had airplanes in, in my neighborhood, uh, planes that I could uh, watch. And, uh, so I began to build models. Uh, I was always building something in my garage. Uh, so I, I built a few uh, uh, strictly 
non-flying models, and I bought some that were capable of flight. Just why? Wind up a rubber band and it fly sometimes two or three minutes. And uh, so that was my uh, introduction to aviation as they wore the, the airplanes from the Air Force. And do you remember the first time you went up in one? First time? Oh, yes. I was in uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. It was 1934. The whole fleet was heading from New York City for a review by President Roosevelt. So we stopped. Uh, in, uh, we were at anchor there in uh, Guantanamo Bay. I guess there must have, I don't know how many ships were there. Uh, but it was just dotted all over. They spread out all over Guantanamo Bay. So we had an enlisted man pilot up over in Memphis. And he, one day, just out of the blue, he knew I liked the airplane. He said, uh, I want to go, uh, I want to fly around the bay a little bit. I said, well, Lord, yes. Yeah. So, I was able to fly with this friend of mine in the, uh, in the original Corsair. Now, the, the name Corsair was used later on by the boat company on the fighter plane, but this was an old biplane Corsair. And we took off, it was a seaplane, we took off from the water and of course landed in the water. But, uh, pardon me, I was able to fly around we were able to fly around the Guantanamo Bay, and uh, I'm not sure what, the, why he was making this flight. Maybe he was assigned to check to see if there any foreign vessels in the perimeter, or anyone was coming in in fishing boats and getting in the middle of the flight. I don't know why, but I enjoyed it, and that was my first flight. So later on, I was able to go off the, on the catapults. That was an experience in itself. Got about a 50 foot catapult in it. Today's, today's carriers, you know, the guys uh, have about a thousand feet of, of flight deck before they have to take over. Anyhow, I, I got uh, to have that experience as catapult and landing in the open ocean when you come in, when you're uh, catapulting out in the ocean. The way you get back aboard the ship, so we can't come back to the ship and land on the ship. So the ship makes a sliding turn, either one way or the other, depending on wind direction. And it knocks the top off the ocean wave. So you, you come in and land in the middle of uh, the wake of the ship that has just made this sliding turn for you. But a lot of times all I do is knock the top tops of the waves off and you get wet because when you, when the nose of the pontoon would dig in, they throw water back and you get a, a good bath. But it was an experience that uh, that, that was a more, well uh, got more fun out of that and excitement. So once you land in the water, you taxi up alongside the ship. They drop a boom over with a hook, hook onto your center section, and lift you up set you back on the catapult for the next shot. Mm. So <laughs> that was pretty tricky too, if it was choppy. Going up, one, one radio operator lost his finger uh, you know, holding that hook down and trying to get it in this sling that's in the center section. He got his finger in the way and the ship went up and the airplane went down and he, he lost his finger. What about the first time you yourself flew one? Oh, that's easy. That was a Spartan. And I bought this flying time on the little Telegraph cabin airplane. And I forget how many hours of instruction I, I took and you went, we went through all of the maneuvers, the 180s and the 360s and the dead sick landing and forced landing and engine failure. I, I guess I had about six hours of instruction. I bought 10, so I was a uh, solo after about six hours and uh, got to fly solo after that for the, full, for the remainder of the 10 hours. So that was, uh, it was in the winter, uh, winter of, uh, winter of 38 and the spring of 39. So I didn't get to fly the C-3s until Six, about six months later, well, I checked out on, 
on them uh, growing. And had a lot, I built up a good amount of time. But I'd flown in the Navy, I'd flown a commercial airplane called the Fleet. Picked up a sail out on the highway one day, hitchhiking out to Chula Vista from San Diego. He said, you want to fly today? You want to fly an airplane today? I said, hey, yeah. He said, well, it'll cost you 10 bucks. He said, it cost me 20, I'll, I'll uh, We'll, we'll go out and uh, I'll let you handle the control. But the fleet biplane was just a small plane like the Spartan. It had 145 horsepower, one hand, and it performed real well. But uh, we, um, we we had a lot of fun that day flying the, the small plane. Then there was a next door neighbor that rebuilt a uh, plane. And I used to give them rides out to Hard Young Airport. And this was an old Swallow airplane, that had an OX-5 World War I motor. It was an old, it was a reconstruction of an old airplane. Well, I loved the old motor because it, it turned so slow. It didn't get the vibration or the noise that you would normally get. So I got to fly the OX-5 Swallow a few times. and. Uh, so I got to fly a variety of airplanes. Mm -hmm. I flew five different airplanes in Spartan. Uh, what, two different models uh, of the Corsair, the fleet. Uh, and uh, so I'm dragging this story out a little time. But uh, it, 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 uh, I was at, I went over to uh, Tulsa Air and Space Museum. And they had a couple of planes hanging, Spartan airplanes. And I knew the stores about bad news. They were, had some bad features. So I was telling the guy who was escorting me through the museum. He said, wait a minute, I better go get the curator. He wanted to know what these stores were. And uh, they crashed. Within the first month I was at Spartan, they crashed two of them. Mm -hmm. So they had a design failure, uh, flaw. So this first, uh, 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 the first guy, the student got in trouble with Julio Rodriguez, a uh, boy from Puerto Rico. He put the thing in the dive, pulled back on the stick, and there was something popped, and the wings folded up around it. He had to fight to get out of it. It was a low-wing monoplane. But they had, had one hanging on the ceiling. So I was telling this guy, I knew some bad things about that plane. So he went and got the curator, I were beating myself. And uh, he, he got interested in not only those planes, but the other planes that I'd flown. I just know that I have a lot of time, but I got to fly a lot of different airplanes that he had some interest in. And uh, so we became friends and uh, he arranged all of this, uh, uh, he got with Spartan and arranged this 100 year celebration for me. I'll never pay him back. I'll not, not repay him in any way. But I, I sure have appreciated uh, my, uh, I guess his interest, uh, what we shared was his interest in old airplanes. Not necessarily. He had a whole, well, if you've been to the museum, there's all kinds of different levels of uh, uh, different stages of air, airplane production. Uh, well, tell us a little bit more about that day. Uh, but the day? The day you got to, to go up for your hundredth. Oh, let's see. Well, they Did started you get to on take the 10th. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't, the plane wasn't available, or the pilot, co pilot wasn't available. But the twenty second, but it was available for the twelfth. So they uh, uh, here at town village, they gave me a supper and a pardon it, a celebration on the tenth. So I, it started on the tenth of April, and then uh, on the eleventh, uh, I had to go out and see if I could get in the plane and out to see if a hundred year old man could get in and out of this cockpit. So I, I got got in and out of in trouble. So the, the next day is when they had the reception at the hangar in Jones 
airport. And they gave me my Spartan diploma and the president of Spartan made a nice speech and patted me on the head. It was a, uh, but there was two or three hundred people I never anticipated any kind of response like that or interest. But there they were and I was, I, I, I had a permanent smile. <laughs> <laughs> two or three days, but I did get to fly in this old C-3. Uh, which was a plane that I had uh, flown in. Not this particular one that was refurbished, but the same model, same horsepower, and so forth. But yes, that was a great experience. Did you get uh, to, to take get off? Back. Did you get to take off and land and uh, do all he, of it? He, it was bumpy that day, and had a plane taking pictures real close to us. So he was on the controls the whole time. I was on the control. All I was doing, I was just going through the motions that he was, uh, I had my feet on the pedals, but I wasn't uh, about to try to uh, fly the plane myself because he was uneasy. Mm -hmm. Well, it was about as bumpy as I ever remember, and these, these planes, uh, this one plane taking pictures had come in real close, maybe well, 30, 40 feet away. So he didn't want me fool. <laughs> he didn't know if I could fly or not, but he didn't. He knew I hadn't flown in seven or three years, so so <laughs> I, I appreciated him. He just let me get an end of things. Sure. So I did enjoy the flight. We flew over parts of Tulsa I hadn't seen from the air, you know, in a long time, and uh, it just the feel, this, the the visibility in an open box open cockpit biplane. That's so much better than a, a closed cabin plane. You can see so much and you can smell the, the, the exhaust fume. It, it's, a, it's a different way of flying. But it, uh, I'd, I'd do it again then. But, <laughs> but they said, I was invited to come back and say, we'll, we'll do it again sometime. The, the, uh, the plane was refurbished by Dennis Hennison, who was a chief maintenance man for, for Spartan at, uh, at uh, Jones Airport, where the Spartan hunting was located. So Dennis has told me more than once, let me know when, when you want to take a flight and we'll, we'll do it. But it was, uh, I've sure made some friends that I, uh, I had no idea that I, I was uh, was capable of uh, having any, uh, them having an interest in me. An exciting day. Oh Lord! Mm -hmm. uh, but it's going on for thirty days. I've had <laughs> in, interviews by two newspapers, three newspapers. I got calls from my hometown. You know, I had people from California calling me. Uh, uh, hey, you're on the internet, and uh, we saw you on the internet. <laughs> So it's uh, been, uh, I couldn't have, uh, well, I enjoyed every minute of it. Well, I haven't had a lot of attention in my life. Well, you, and the older you get, uh, the more you do enjoy it, I guess. Yeah, well, at what point did you realize you were going to make it to 100? Uh, April the 21st. <laughs> <laughs> of this year? Yeah. <laughs> Had, had anyone else in your family lived to be a hundred? Uh, yes, I had an aunt that lived to be a hundred and two. She was uh, the daughter of Judith Kilby Smith, my great-great-grandmother, who was the only civilian casualty in the fighting in my hometown. Yeah, I, I just got a letter here to, today uh, uh, about that, but there was a um, Right now, I, uh, I lost my train of thought there, but uh, talking about age, she was, uh, uh, sh she married a wealthy banker in Washington, D.C. And uh, she was, she lived in a Waterman Park Hotel, I guess one time, most prestigious, what's the word I'm fishing for, prestigious. Uh, she lived in luxury and had, had good attention, so she, she lived over a hundred. But her mother and the five boys in the farmhouse between, well, between where the fighting was going on, 
both sides thought this farmhouse was was a spot had spotters and had military people in it, so they began to fire at the farmhouse. So the whole family makes a room for the woods. The mother, my great great grandmother, uh, was hit and bled to death in the woods that night. And uh, uh, Elizabeth, the, the, the tiny baby, she, she was just a baby in arms. She, Aunt Elizabeth that lived to be 102. So I, when I start telling the story, I get distracted. And some of the side stories that, and that uh, I, I get lost every once in a while. Do you think? What do you think your secret is to live all, in the All day. Well, I practice up saying things that make people laugh, uh, raucous things. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is far different. Just um, having good genes, inheriting good genes, and having a good wife who's a good cook and interested in, in your own personal health. And Ruth was, was uh, she never tried to make me reduce uh, 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 fatty foods or any of the usual things that, that wives do. To, well, I don't know how she did it, but she kept me well fed and and healthy for 68 years, and that's why I'm sitting here. Yeah. And going back to flying, did you ever fly competitively? Competitive? No. Uh, my, some of my instructors were uh, uh, had flown competitively and had a friend. Oh, good luck! Here I'm getting into another story of a competitive flyer. Used to fly. He came, he came up when I was driving race cars and he got a gasoline mixture for me with some nitro that he used in his, his plane. He had Roscoe Turner, you know, Roscoe Turner, way back in the early 30s, I guess. Mm -hmm. He and Roscoe were always at each other. Uh, they'd, one, one race Roscoe would win and the guy's name was Earl Ortman. And Earl, uh, brought me the, uh, the uh, fuel to try out and this old Willis that I was trying to drive. And it helped some, but uh, that was uh, uh, a professional race driver, airplane, professional airplane race driver that I got to know, racing pilot. I'm fishing for words. I haven't got, gone into this, this part of it so long. <laughs> oh, I'm curious, did you ever parachute? No, I had to wear them, but I never did. Yeah. Well, the uh, incident about the parachute, uh, as a radio operator, I filled in for other operators when they were uh, incapacitated or not available and so forth. So one day, it was a big heavyset guy, he must have uh, weighed a couple hundred pounds. It didn't show up, so they called me and, Miller, uh, you want to fly today? Got to get back to the planes on the uh, planes on the catapult, ready to go. So they rushed me down there. So I had to get in there and fit on this big parachute. The straps were adjusted for this big fat guy, no big mess muscular guy actually. So I slipped them over my shoulders and went through the procedure of making sure the radio set was secure and the toolbox went through a routine. We took off. And I didn't get a chance to adjust the parachute straps. So we go up and we were doing a, a uh, um, another plane would fly by with a target. And the radio operator had a machine gun and we'd, we'd fire at try to hit this target as it go by. Well, well I was following this tar target, I was leading it quite a bit. And, uh, and uh, I was getting too close to the wing. And the pilot got uneasy, so he dipped the plane over to the right side. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I started machine gun fire, I took the parachute straps off because I couldn't handle the machine gun. I just so when he threw the plane over to one side, I was holding on to the machine gun in one hand and trying to grab hold of the cowling in the other. Well, we were over about oh, I don't want to exaggerate, but. If we had gone over another 10 degrees, I might, I might have fallen out. <laughs> so that, uh, that was, uh, I learned if, that if I 
feel nothing for anybody, uh, I should adjust my parachute before we, before we got, uh, got in the air, really. Yeah, I, that pilot looked out, he could see the traces. He could see me, I was on the target. But I, I was coming too close to his wing, to the bot plane wing. He thought, I was just right, right on the verge of shutting off the machine gun. So uh, that, uh, he didn't he didn't realize that I didn't have a parachute on. Uh, that wasn't a, a very pleasant experience. But I learned from it that to adjust those straps before I, before we took off. Oh, that whole flight was a mess. The radio set is held in into a track. You can pull it clear out and. Put another one in, in there. That two knobs on the front. You got rubber bands called shock cords, you know. And you pull the shock cords over the, the knobs, and that keeps the radio set on the, in the track, and it lets it, it gives it some motion. So when we go off the catapult, uh, there's no damage done to it. Well, here another here's another case where I was. Uh, um, was filling in for this pilot, uh, for this radio operator. So I checked the radio set, pushed it back up like it should, checked the toolbox and closed it up. We took off before I could pull those rubber bands around the radio set in the toolbox. I managed to hold the radio, when we took off with the catapult, I managed to hold the radio set by the toolbox, spill all those tools out of my lap, and they were kicking around in the floor. So I had two unfortunate uh, experiences uh, by not being prepared when we went off the catapult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> close calls. Did you have any close calls? In the Navy? As you know, when you were driving the plane? When you oh, were piloting the plane? at Spartan? Yeah. Well, I think I did. Uh, I lost an engine. Take it back. Lost all that oil from an engine on one of the C3s. I was uh, had a co-pilot. We went out to the practice field east of the internet uh, of Tulsa Municipal, and for some reason or other, he didn't want to come back. Didn't want to fly back. He said, "You you fly the plane back." So I, I brought it back, tied it up to the hangar, and Bill Madden, mechanic, walked out. <laughs> What in the hell is going on? It oil just all over the belly of the plane. So he took the cowling oh, where he could look at the end. And the nose cone had had about maybe 15 or 20 studs. Some of those studs had broken. The main bearing had uh, uh, given out inside. And the crankshaft was, was rotating the propeller and the propeller shaft in this nose cone. And it popped the studs. So when when the studs popped, well, the, the surfaces parted and all the oil, all the oil ran out. So that was wasn't an accident, but uh, was, I could if I'd been flying very much longer, I'd have lost an engine, and uh, most probably wouldn't have had any problem, any problem getting it down. And good flying old airplanes fly themselves. Did you ever take Ruth up? Uh, yes, but not in the C-3s, yes, in the, uh, there was a, uh, a pilot who had an old Beechcraft airplane at Tulsa Municipal Airport, uh, and he was carrying passengers, and Ruth and I and the children came out one time, and we were just standing and watching what he was doing, and uh, he saw me standing there and said, no, uh, Take off and take a flight and check my motor here. He made something off and said, Come on, uh, we'll, we'll charge them things. I'm just going to see if the plane is flying right. So I did take Ruth and the children up for a flight in an old beach craft over the city of Dalton and back. And, but uh, I used to, once in a while, uh, Ruth, when Ruth was pregnant, she'd get out and find something. Some 
place out in the open where she could walk. She liked to walk. And a couple of mornings, I'd come up and I'd look for her. <laughs> I'd fly around over the residential areas I'd try to find. This was out the, around the airport and one minute homes and a lot of empty highways, uh, roads, streets. So, but uh, I got uh, someone called in and complained about an airplane flying too low over the home. <laughs> So I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, try to find Ruth on her <laughs> daily walks after that, <laughs> but she did uh, walk a lot on the, around the uh, airport uh, residential areas, I guess you'd say. Well, the airport's really changed a lot since oh, you the, were doing those things. Gone. I went out there. I've been out there several times. Every time I go, there's more gone. All the old hangars are gone, and the school buildings, yeah, they're all, they've all been destroyed and cleared off. My home I bought about three blocks away from the airport, was it was, it was gone. It was torn down years ago. So I've got a lot of good memories when I go out there, but they, uh, which is nothing to remind me very much of it, what it really looked like. Let's switch gears and have you tell us about this yeah. gold thing. Well, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Ruth and I, when we were working at Lockheed, we found a bar up on its almost mountain top, east of Palo Alto, about 1,800 feet. Up. Yeah, about six or seven miles of a winding road that followed Stevens Creek. And the creek is only uh, five or six feet wide. There's quite a lot of water. So when we go up, we go up to this bar and have a few drinks on the weekend and enjoy the scenery. It, you can't imagine the variety of scenery on Stevens Creek. You'd have to go there. But at different levels, uh, you'd see strange vegetation like, uh, like you see down in the tropics. There's hanging moss. Mm -hmm. The places, as you go up, as you go up to the top of the mountain, you're passing through some of the prettiest variety of scenery that I can remember. So one day, Ruth and I were coming back, and I was looking over there, uh, to the water, and I saw some bed springs. I said, who in the hell would throw a bed spring <laughs> here, halfway, well, two-thirds of the way up this mountain top? in a beautiful stream of water. So I said, Ruth, I'm going to get that thing out of there. So I stopped my car and I went down, I got this bed springs and I picked them up. I threw them. I was mad. I threw it as far as I could. Well, a little black head hopped up. I thought it was a snake. It didn't come clear up out of the water right at first. But then as the current began to move it, after the weight of the springs was off of it, it began to float down down the stream. The rest of it began to. So what in the hell is that? But I thought it was a snake when I saw that. So I picked it up and I fished it out of the water and took it home. And uh, it had been burned. It had some burned areas. So I cleaned it up as best I could and painted it. Well, I've had a lot of good luck since then. I've always. Wanted to think uh, that I was just re being repaid for rescuing it. my ding pod, uh, we called it, <laughs> out of the water. Couldn't think of any other name as a ding pod. <laughs> <laughs> and have no idea what it was? Well, I, I, someone that I was talking to later uh, told me that it was part of a man, uh, manzanilla root, a manzanilla tree root. I've never seen a manzanilla tree. I don't know what it looks like, but down below the surface of the ground, this is what's going on. But you, but you it has such it, an unusual content. You know, the, the surfaces are different all the way around. So it, uh, I've got a lot of pleasure out of it. You've, you've had it for quite a while. Yes, this, the is, the this is the secret to longevity. Yes, in 1964. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> the good luck piece. I've often thought that, uh, Alex. <laughs> often thought that. Well, well, 
Well, when history is written, what do you want it to say about you? About me. I don't think I could summarize, summarize, summarize it. Uh, because so much of it uh, was good, and so much of it was bad. I would like to have been an officer in the Navy, and I could have. I was, I was told by my division officer that if I behaved myself, I'd be sent to a school in Washington, D.C., where they train radio gunners. Not, they use gunners as a slang term. Uh, warrant officers, radio warrant officers, and then you can go on up into the higher ranks. Once you get the gold braid, you know, the warrant officers had a uniform just like the Annapolis men, and I uh, give them opportunities for advancement that uh, they wouldn't have had if they just uh, hadn't taken the special schooling. It's, I imagine, I don't know for sure, I think it was kind of like a finishing college to prepare these men for an officer's life. Mm -hmm. I want to make them as close to officers and gentlemen, I suppose, as they... Besides, they learned, they were taught all the latest electronics devices that were being brought in on about that time. But at that time, I was assigned to Admiral Courtney's personal staff. Every Admiral has a certain number of people within the, his is, uh, I guess the word staff would apply. And when he moves from one ship to the next, one ship needs repairs or whatever reason, uh, you, follow, you have to follow the animal. Well, you're, you are a carrot uh, as part of the, uh, and this is in my record, in my record, in my, uh, in my Navy record. Yes. Most probably I got a decent discharge and, I got some recommendations in there as well. Connections with uh, the rescue of the Macon, Dur the Dursville, that Navy Dursville that was destroyed, had a structural failure in the, f uh, the, in the, in the fin. Our ship got a direction finder bearing on it as it was falling. We got there ahead of all the other ships in the fleet. We were the first ones there. We got, we rescued 57 men. Of the 80 some crew, 80 some men in the, in the making crew. <laughs> but a lot of people I never saw them on those big old dirigibles, 800 and some feet long. They carried five airplanes in the belly. Mm -hmm. yeah, quite a piece of machinery. Crashed in the sea off, San, off Big Sur, California. And they were, someone salvaged. One of those old airplanes a couple of years ago, I read about. I read about that. I don't know whether they were rebuilt it or not. Whether they were rebuildable. But, yeah. So I did. I did have some recommendations, some commendations in, in my record that uh, where the Navy put up with a lot of uh, time in the hospital. I was spending more time in the hospital than was aboard ship before. For a while. And that's when, I, that's what the uh, that car wreck. That um, well, of course, then I then I had the motorcycle problem, and I fell overboard one time. It gets worse and worse. I'll tell you. <laughs> Can <laughs> but, you swim? Uh, beg pardon. Can you swim? Oh, sure. Yeah, in the middle of the night. You don't want me to tell that story, do you? <laughs> it's nothing. Uh, uh, It'd be very scary. What, huh? Very scary. Well, it should have been, but I hadn't been drinking, and I never was afraid of anything. And I was, uh, uh, we went to anchor, so I was floating from the place where I fell overboard back to where they, Motor launches were, were moored, and I was going to pull myself up on one of the horses that, were, that uh, the launches were, were moored to. But well, there was one guy back on the stern of the ship, one o'clock in the morning, smoking a cigarette. 
Usually the shift's deserted except between the, except when shift's saying, this one guy didn't want to go down below to his bunk, so he's standing up as here I came floating by, had about a four or five knot tied there in the harbor. So I wasn't hollering nothing, thing, but he he saw me and he hollered and uh, I didn't answer it. So he went over and trigger, triggered the general alarm. One o'clock in the morning. When the general alarm comes on, the captain gets up, the commanders get up. The entire ship's company had to get up at one o'clock in the morning. And they had a rush, fire rescue boat at, at the, that they put in the water and picked me up, took me up to the gangway and took me down to the sick bed. I didn't want to tell you that story. I was, <laughs> I was ashamed of that, but I was, uh, I was a fellow boy, I was vomiting. We had aviation fumes in this gun room, in the gun compartment where my sleeping quarters were. And we complained about it, but um, I wasn't the only fellow was getting sick and throwing up. Uh, this, this time, there's one place, one place between the torpedo tubes and the gun housing, the gun compartment, that has a chain. It's tied onto the end of the torpedoes. But they, they had a drill that day and the torpedo man had forgot to hook the chain back up. So I got in the middle of the night, dark as all get out on top side. I was trying to keep from involving on that deck. So I was going, going to run to the side of the ship and let it go over the side. And then there just wasn't any the lifeline there. So I ended up in the water. But it all started out from the, the fumes. Coming back to the ship, uh, full of beer and whatnot. But uh, the, a couple of nights before that, there's a radio operator in a bunk above me. Uh, above me had gotten sick. He had just leaned over his bunk and let it go in my shoes. <laughs> I got up to go on watch. So I thought I was doing everybody a favor by trying to trying to uh, get sick over the side, and I ended up over the side myself. Isn't that awful to have, have to tell that story? No. But that does... Uh, I'm sure you weren't the only one. Yeah. Well, I don't know if anybody that ever fell overboard <laughs> in my uh, six years in the Navy. Well, I'm sure someone had to have. Well, I'll tell you, the Navy uh, frowns on that kind of activity, <laughs> and they decided that, that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a suitable material for any further advancements. <laughs> That's awful. Well, I should have kept that one to myself. No. If you have any final advice for persons that are getting ready to turn 100, what would it be? I'm sorry, Alex. If you had any advice to someone... Advice? Who, what, what type of advice would you give oh, someone no, who's getting ready to turn 100? I wish I was capable, Alex. I, I don't feel capable of telling someone else how to do it. Because people's lives are so different. Do you still drive? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. But not planning any distance. Uh, like Walgreens. I go down and get my medicine, don't have to go a block. I do on occasion, but maybe once or a couple of weeks, or I go to the grocery store. I wait until 10 o'clock in the morning when, when traffic is, is as light as it's going to get. And I'm, I, I do uh, I get my own groceries, but I'm, I'm making arrangements with my my, my son's ex-wife, who took me to the doctor today, so that I won't I'll be endangering anybody. So uh, the answer is yes, but uh, I know I shouldn't, and I'm going to make up. I'm in process of making other arrangements, finding other ways to handle it. Well, do you have a philosophy that you live by or have lived by? No, I don't think I've had enough education to really, uh, well, 
I don't believe that I'm qualified or I have enough good experiences to pass them on pass them on to someone who could benefit by them. Mm. Mm. Is there anything left on your bucket list you want to do? Gosh, that's a, I'd like to go back to California for a short visit. I'd like to go, go to San Diego and then go up to uh, Santa Monica. For, I was there for a month. I didn't mention that. And then uh, I'd like to go to San Francisco and then to Sonoma. I don't, I'd like to see the, those three, but I won't. Uh, just, I'm realistic. I can always uh, look forward and, uh, and think about I think how enjoyable it would be. But then you begin, you lose sight of the things, oh, physically what it would cause, what it could cause. I wouldn't want to get out uh, uh, 3,000 miles away from home and have some kind of a, a problem with my heart. I've had two uh, heart attacks. I have three stent sleeves in my heart. And I occasionally have to take uh, a nitroglycerin pill. So, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, yes, I'd love, I'd love to take a trip back to California for about a week, no more than a week or ten days. But uh, I don't want to cause any problems for my family. If I got out there and even if I was escorted and got in trouble, they all want to come and help me get home. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would put me, put me away. <laughs> well, uh, then you know, I bad. <laughs> How bad the situation was. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add before we close out? Yes, I'd like to thank you folks for being interested in, in what I've done, and I hope I, uh, I haven't exaggerated anything. And uh, I guess uh, I don't know how many other people get this attention, but I know they would all appreciate it like I have, and it'll be a pleasant memory for a long time, I hope. It's been a pleasure meeting you and hearing oh, your story you today. Know, Thank well, you. You know I've enjoyed blabbering up. What a master. If you go up in the plane again, I want to go too. What, huh? When you go up in the plane again, I want to go too. Hey, okay. Okay. Why not?